followed the news closely. I, on the other hand, at six, understood very little of the national news, but from my six-year-old perspective, I could have told you a great deal about what life was like for someone like me. One of the nearly 43,000 American children affected by the 1949 polio epidemic, I was a quadriplegic. Though my life wasn't marked with the little whites-only signs that signaled segregation in the South, the life I lived was also a segregated one. Of course, I, I, of course I didn't understand this for a long time, shielded as I was by the love of my family and friends. For me, at six, my city block was my whole world, and there was no place I would rather have been. In of 1953, you would have quite likely found me on my way to Arlene's house next door, pushing myself in my manual wheelchair down the sidewalk in tiny increments. To get to Arlene's, my journey started with my mother pushing me down the ramp from our house to the sidewalk. Once there, I would grip the rims of my wheelchair tires and inch my way along. It would be another 15 years before I would have an electric wheelchair. At that time, a Canadian, George Klein, motivated by the needs of returning World War II veterans, was in the process of inventing the electric wheelchair, but the chair was still four years away from mass production. Because my bout with polio as an infant had left me with very little strength in my arms, moving my manual wheelchair took all my effort. The key to getting to our lean and back was a minuscule incline in the sidewalk between our two houses. It was the tiniest incline you can imagine, and it would have been invisible to any pedestrian walking by. But I knew that if I could get myself to the top of it, I could then coast down the other side. As I wa worked my way up the sidewalk, I could hear the radio through our kitchen window where my little four-year-old brother Joey was eating his cereal with my mother and my baby brother Ricky my, my father having left for our butcher shop in the, heart, in the hours of the morning. Nearly at the top of the incline, I held my breath as my chair crept up the last infinitesimal rise, the sun hot on the back of my head, hair falling over my eyes. Without thinking, I took one hand off the wheel to brush the hair off my face. The wheel, without the stabilizing force of both my hands, slipped, and I rolled all the way back to my original seat. Sighing, I left my head. I lifted my head and looked around, hopefully. Any kids out yet? I looked for anyone who might be able to give me a little push. But the street was quiet. I took a deep breath, bent my head, and started out. Sometime later, five minutes, ten, thirty, time has a different meaning when you're sick. I landed in front of Arlene's stoop and looked at the three steps up to the door. The part of the expedition that made me feel awkward. I couldn't get my wheelchair up the steps to ring Orla Orlene's doorbell, which meant I had to sit on the sidewalk in front of her house and yell for her to come out to play. I sat for a few minutes. Arlene's house had a narrow red brick front with white siding on the upper level and a small patch of flowers on a small rectangular lawn. It was just like ours, minus our blue hydrangeas. If the car was in front of the house, I knew the Elmskogs were home. With any luck, someone would come out and see me. I shifted my gaze to our house. I could hear Uncle Frank, who wasn't our uncle, but we called him uncle anyway, yelling from the Bull's house on the other side of Arlene. But no one came out of the Bull's house either. Eyeing Arlene's bedroom window on the second floor, I watched for her shadow. Her white curtains gently stirred gently in the wind. I glanced up and down the street one last time to see if anyone had come out to play. A bird chirped, flew across the street, and landed, landed on the bull's roof. Gathering my courage, I called out, Arlene, can you come out and play? I waited, embarrassed. I had to yell loud enough that Arlene or her mom or dad or brothers could hear me, but didn't want to yell so loud that the whole block could hear me. Nothing. I couldn't hear anything inside the house. I tried again a little bit louder. Arlene, can you come out and play? I paused and watched the house. Still, nothing. 
I stopped worrying about whether or not the whole block could hear me and hollered, Harley! I shouted as loudly as I could, Come out and play! Hi, Judy! Arlene's mom came to the door. Arlene will be out in a minute. Five minutes later, Arlene appeared at the front door in a green checkered dress, her brown hair down, a doll tucked under her arm. My mom and Arlene's mom, whom we called Aunt Ivy, always made us wear dresses. So did our best friend Mary's mom, whom we called Aunt Ruth. Arlene leapt down the three steps. What should we do? Let's see if Mary can play, I said. Arlene pushed my wheelchair the three seconds it took to get to Mary's house, and then went up the steps and rang the doorbell to see if Mary could play. Aunt Ruth said yes, and Mary came out, her blonde hair tied in a ponytail, a doll in hand, and she and Arlene pushed me into any back into my backyard so we could play dolls in the shade of our big maple tree, which we loved to do. I was lucky that Mar Mary and Arlene lived on my side of the street because I never could have gotten my chair off my sidewalk, across the street, and up the curb on the other side, no matter how many inclines there were in between. In between. For me, a curb was the Great Wall of China. Eventually, other children on the block would come out to play. Patsy, Beth, Teddy, my brother Joey, Mary's brothers Eddie and Billy, Arlene's brother Paul, and Frankie, who was older. The street was one way and few cars drove on it. It didn't occur to me then to think it unusual that I joined all the kids' games in my wheelchair, because there was never a question of whether or not I would play. Two, we all figured out, oh, sorry, because there was never a question of whether or not I would, I would play too. We all figured out a way for me to do whatever everyone else was doing. Even we, when we jumped rope or roller skated, we figured it out. We'd put roller skates over my shoes and I would pretend to be skating in my chair, or I'd turn the rope for the jumpers, or play in some other way. I didn't know anything different. Now I know this was, now I know that this was the way it was because we were kids and kids are problem solvers. But it taught me at a very early age that most things are possible when you assume that problems can be solved. On Saturday nights, the parents were home and often outside, the dads barbecuing and the moms chatting, setting the picnic table. We would smell the hamburgers and frankfurters on the grills and would wait hungrily for them to be ready, playing on the street. On Sundays, Joey and I went to Hebrew school. Afterward, we'd pile into the car and go to the beach to visit my Uncle Leon, or Uncle Alfred and the cousins in Seagate, a neighborhood on Coney Island, in Coney Island, or swim in our inflatable backyard pool. Then, in September, summer ended and school started. The mornings became chilly and everything changed. September was when Mary and her siblings went to Catholic school, and Arlene, her brothers, and my little brother Joey went to public school, and I should have been going with them, but I wasn't. I still remember the day I was five and my mother had taken me to register for kindergarten. My mother helped me put on a nice dress, pushed me to school, and pulled my wheelchair up the steps, but the principal refused to allow me to enter. Judy is a fire hazard, he said, explaining to my shocked mother how the school system saw wheelchairs as a dangerous obstruction. Children who used wheelchairs were not permitted to attend school. I would stay home. And so had begun, from that day forward, my mother's long fight to get me into school. It wasn't that my father wasn't involved. He cared very much about my education, but he was working at our butcher shop from four in the morning until seven at night. The day-to-day -day work of fighting fell on my mother, which I took, I take as a sign. Because if the universe really hadn't wanted me to go to school, it wouldn't have made Ilse Herman, human, my mother. Telling Ilse Herman that something wasn't possible was a big mistake. One of the first things my mother did was try to get me into a local yeshiva, a Jewish day school. The principal at the yeshiva had told my mother I could go to school if I learned enough Hebrew, no doubt trying to get rid of her politely. I honestly don't think my mother realized that this was his way of saying no, probably because my mother didn't really hear the word no. 
He listens for the smallest crack in any negative answer that would turn it into a yes. My mother was the embarrassment with the embodiment of persistence. Which is funny because she was so easy to underestimate from the outside. My father called her mighty might. No, not much over five feet tall. She had a big, beautiful smile that put people at ease. You didn't really see the steel underneath until it blindsided you. So whether she thought it was reasonable or not, my mother was going to make sure I learned Hebrew. She asked my physical therapist's wife, who was Israeli, to teach me Hebrew. And for weeks, my mother drove me to their apartment every day for tutoring. Until, as my mother joked later, I spoke Hebrew better than the students. But when she called the principal to tell him that I'd learned Hebrew and she wanted to enroll me at the end of the summer, the principal, likely shocked that my mother had actually followed through, backtracked. Well, it's just not going to work, he said. My mother did not cry over spilled milk. She moved on. Not long after the yeshiva turned us down, the New York City Board of Education called my mother to tell her about a possible program for me and invited us to come and visit. This was the first time that my mother realized that there was no exception, expectation that I would attend an integrated school with non-disabled children. When we visited the program, I remember thinking that it didn't seem like the school my friends told me about. Kids were not at their desks and it seemed chaotic. My mother and father refused to put me into this program. A few weeks into what would have been my first grade year, the Board of Education called my mother and told her I was now eligible for home instruction. Whereupon they sent a teacher, Mrs. Campfield, to our ha house two days a week. The first day for an hour and the second day for an hour and a half. To sit at the card table in my bedroom and teach me. The idea that I could learn anything mean meaningful in two and a half hours of instruction a week was, of course, ludicrous. Although Mrs. Hanfield was a nice woman and I did like having someone other than my mother teaching me. My parents weren't given instruction materials or books or anything to supplement my, ex my instruction. Obviously, there was no intention that home instruction was to be comparable in any way to what Joey or my friends were receiving. But I had no idea of any of this because I was just a kid. And I was a happy kid. As far as I knew, the Catholic kids on my block went to Catholic school. The Protestant kids and my brother went to public school, and I went to school at home. We all went to different schools. When Joey started kindergarten that year in 1953, and I stayed at home, I'd had a vague feeling that something was not quite right, but I couldn't have put it into words. At home, I did the meager homework that Mrs. Hampfield left for me, but what I mainly did was read. I read and read and read. In the afternoon, my brother came home from school or a friend came over. I would know it was time to go out and play. Then I'd play and it was time, until it was time for my afternoon extracurricular activities for that day. After the regular school day, I participated in all the same extracurricular activities as Joey and my cousins and friends. I had Hebrew school on Sundays, Mondays, and Thursdays, scouts on Tuesdays, and piano on Wednesdays. In my afternoon activities, I never felt different from the other kids, even though I was the only one in the wheelchair. Well, I did sometimes feel a little awkward about getting schlepped up the stairs backwards to brownies or getting carried down the back steps and through the garbage behind the synagogue to get to the elevator for Hebrew classes. One day, my poor mother tripped on a broom as she was tipping my wheelchair back, bouncing it down the steps, and I flipped out of my wheelchair and busted my lip. But other than wondering why they didn't just have a ramp like the one at our house, I didn't think much about it. Once I got to where I was going, I was always perfectly content to do my arts and crafts or study Hebrew or learn about Jewish culture with all the other kids. And so in the humidity of hum summer, I played in the streets until September when everyone went to school and I stayed home. Then Mrs. Campfield would knock on my door, worksheets in hand, and Hebrew school, piano lessons, and brownies started. The leaves changed colors and dropped, and the snow came, blanketing our street. Aunt Ruth, Aunt Ivy, and our neighbor, Mrs. Malam, a scout leader and later my math tutor, would come for coffee with my mother. 
After school with Mrs. Campfield, I played outside with Arlene, Mary, Patsy, Beth, and Kenny. On the Jewish holidays, we went to synagogue. On Sundays, we went to Hebrew school. And afterward, we'd visit aunts, uncles, and cousins, or we'd go to museums. Other times, my parents would buy tickets for the theater or ballet or the opera. From his youth, my father had always loved these activities, sometimes walking miles to get to the theater in his neighboring town in Germany, where he would hand out flyers just so he could get into the performances. He made sure we were exposed to arts and culture. None of the buses or trains were accessible, but my father or mother would fold my wheelchair and put it into the trunk of our car, and off we would go. On certain Sundays, we'd eat a lovely brunch of bagels, lox, and whitefish with delicious sweets, eggs, and pastrami, cooked with care by my dad. The company at our dining room table was never boring. My father liked to provoke discussion and create debates. At that time, we had morning and evening newspapers, and he, my mother, and my brothers, and I would read newspapers, magazines, and books all the time. In our house, if you held an opinion on something, you had to be prepared to defend it. We argued, discussed, and laughed so much that I am sure the neighbors would hear us through the windows. Then, when summer came and school ended, it would be time to start playing in the streets again. In this way, Ricky grew and started walking. Joey started first grade, and then second, and I turned seven and eight. If I were painting those days in color, I would use bright pinks and lavenders. There were curves and steps to conquer, and I wasn't allowed in school, but I was a cheerful, contented girl. Until the day we walked to the candy store. I think it was a beautiful sunny day, but it might have been cloudy, I don't remember. What I do remember was being caught up in my conversation with Arlene as she pushed me in my wheelchair, talking about what we were going to buy at the candy store or what we wanted to do later that day. We were pleased to be walking around the corner to buy sweets. In front of Dr. Nagler's brick house, which I knew was Dr. Nagler's house because I'd been there with my mother for her doctor's appointments, we paused to cross the street. Arlene turned me around to lower my wheelchair off the curb, pushed me across the street, and then once we reached the other side, she put her foot on the metal bar on the back of my chair, kicked me in the chair back. That's my cat. Pixie. Um, sorry. She put her foot on the metal bar on the back of my chair, kicked me in the chair back, and lifted my chair onto the sidewalk. As we did this, a few kids came forward, came towards us from the opposite direction. They were walking slowly down the sidewalk. As they passed, Arlene shifted my wheelchair to the side to make room for them. We didn't know them and didn't pay much attention, engrossed as we were in our conversation. So I was surprised when one of the kids turned suddenly to look at me. He stood in front of me, staring down at me at my, in my wheelchair. Are you sick? He said loudly. I stared at him, not understanding. What? Are you sick? He repeated insistently. His voice boomed. I shook my head, trying to clear the words away. I was still confused, but I couldn't speak. Are you sick? He asked, slowing the words down as if I were a toddler. The world went silent as the words reverberated in my head. I couldn't hear anything except those words. Are you sick? Sick. 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 I shrank down, frozen with confusion, wanting to cover myself up with something, anything to hide from that question, the boy's insistent eyes on me. Are you sick? He said, insistently, almost shouting. Suddenly, I became aware of Dr. Negler's house behind me, and my face turned a cringingly deep red. Does he think I'm going to the doctor? But he's not my doctor, I thought, fiercely. I fought back tears. I couldn't, I wouldn't cry in front of everyone. I wasn't sick. It made no sense. I knew I wasn't. But then why was he asking me that? I became uncertain of myself. Was I sick? I saw myself through his eyes, and the light around me shifted. Shadows emerged from the corners of my mind. Previously submerged words, thoughts, and half-heard conversations tumbled into the glare of a spotlight. In a blinding flash, everything in my life made a perverse kind of sense. 
I couldn't go to this school. I couldn't go to that school. I couldn't do this. I couldn't do that. I couldn't walk up the stairs. I couldn't open doors. I couldn't even cross the street. I was different. But I'd always known that. It wasn't that. It was the world and how it saw me. The world thought I was sick. Sick people stayed home in bed. They didn't go out to play or go to school. They weren't expected to go outside, to be a part of things, to be a part of the world. I wasn't expected to be a part of the world. Abruptly, I knew this to be true, as if the knowledge had already existed for years throughout my entire body. I felt humiliated at the idea that everyone else had known this but me. Had they kept it from me? The embarrassment settled as a cold ball deep in my stomach where I could feel it spreading into my limbs. Was it sunny or cloudy? I don't know. I remember Arlene was pushing me and we were going to the store to buy candy and we were chatting. And I was a butterfly becoming a caterpillar. That night I said nothing to my family. At dinner, as my brothers loudly discussed something with my parents, I was quiet. I ate and then went to bed. The next morning I woke up had breakfast and went out to play with Mary and Arlene, Patsy and Beth, Teddy and all the kids on the block. I played jump rope. Then I sat with them and talked about all the things we normally talked about. On Monday, my brother went to school. Mrs. Campfield came and my brother came home and we went to Hebrew school. And then on Thursday, I had piano and brownies. It was all the same, but something was different. I was self-conscious now, a feeling changed in some unspeakable way that I didn't really understand. After that day, nothing was ever quite the same. Cat, stop. She's very <laughs> grumbly in the morning. Around that time, I became conscious of the faulty logic behind me not being out allowed to go to school with my brother. The school had steps, yes, but my father carried me up two flights of steps all the time to get to services at the synagogue. Why couldn't I just be carried up the steps to school every day? I didn't get it. It seemed like such a simple problem, the kind of problem we solved every day on my block. Although I knew my parents wanted me in school, they didn't actually talk about the reasoning behind why the school district objected. And I didn't ask. Perhaps because it felt like a topic so shaded and veiled that I kept quiet about it. Then, not long after the incident on the way to the candy store, my mother finally succeeded at getting me into a school, and everything changed. On my first day of school, I woke up early. My father had kissed me good luck before he went to work, sometime between four and five in the morning. After he left, I couldn't fall back asleep. School! My heart thumped with anxiety and excitement. Lying in bed restless, I shifted my arms and looked toward the accordion door between my bedroom and the kitchen. I wished my mother would come walking in to get me dressed. I didn't think I could wait for the bus to come at seven. But the house remained utterly quiet. Sinking back into my pillow, I stared at the ceiling and took a breath. Maybe I could will her to come. Turning toward the door, I closed my eyes and concentrated with all my might, picturing my mother coming into the bedroom. I opened my eyes, hopefully. Still, nothing. Giving up, I lay back down and closed my eyes. I was used to waiting. Over the three years since we've been turned down by the yeshiva, my mother had been searching for alternatives or organizing with other parents. We didn't have a lot of money, so any potential solution for me had to be either a public option, option or something that fit on my fa in our family's slim budget. My mother had sought out parents of other kids who had had polio, researched schools, met with people from the New York City Board of Education, talked to whoever would talk to her, and ferreted out information. Because of this, I'd been placed on a waiting list for Health Cons Conservation 21, a program for kids with disabilities that was offered in various schools around the district. Eventually, I reached the top of the waiting list, had been asked to come in for an assessment, and then finally had been invited to a class. Being put on a waiting list and evaluated for my ability to attend a public school in the United States should have been illegal, 
but that was overlooked by the Board of Education. And since the screening hadn't initiated until late fall, it was winter by the time I got approved, which meant I was starting school halfway through the fourth grade, and I was nine years old. My mother wanted me to wear the pink dress with the flowers for my first day of school. Since I was reliant on my mother's help to get up and get dressed, as well as for the rest of my daily necessities, this put me at a disadvantage when I wanted to wear something different than what she wanted. Normally, she would have just picked something, taken it out of my closet, and gotten me dressed, anxious to get my brother up and going. <clears throat> but this time, she took the time to let me choose, and I got to wear what I wanted instead. And I picked my green dress. First, my mother put my blue tights on, then she put my feet into my shoes and hooked the shoes into my long leg braces with the spinal corset. Then she stood me up, put my dress on, and gave me my crutches so I could slowly walk to the bathroom, which was immediately to the right of my bedroom. At that time, I still had enough strength in my arms to go to the bathroom by myself. My mother then helped me brush my long brown hair to make it shine. I got into my wheelchair and pushed myself to the dining room while my mother ran upstairs to make sure Joey was awake. Sitting by myself at the table, I ate a spoonful of cereal, half listening to the radio talk about the snow. I was finally going to start to learn in a classroom with kids my age. With kids my age. Better late than never, I thought. I poked at the cornflakes in my bowl. What would it be like to go to school? My stomach somersaulted with anticipation at the thought. Leaving home for school was a massive change. I'd been hearing about classes and grades from my brothers and my friends for years, but I'd never actually been in a classroom or nor even been told what grade I was in. And now I knew I was going to be in fourth grade, although in an entirely new school. No one I knew would be going to Health Conservation 21 since the program was only for disabled kids, although I didn't really know what this meant. But I had casually, while I had casually met some disabled kids in the hospital, I'd never spent long periods of time with them. I thought about this fact, nibbling at a tiny bite of cereal. I was nervous about taking the bus by myself. I'd never been on a bus. I wondered how I would get into it, since all the buses I knew of had steps. I was also confused about how long I should expect to be on the bus. My mother had told me the bus was supposed to come to our house at around 7 a.m. and that we were supposed to arrive at school around 8.30 a.m. But if those times were right, it would mean I would be on the bus for an hour and a half, which seemed weird to me because school was only 15 minutes away by car. Giving up my breakfast, I put my spoon down. Mom, I'm done! I yelled impatiently. I wanted to pack my school bag with a pencil holder and a notebook. My mother went to the front of the house to look out the window for the bus. But it was lucky, my German shepherd, who heard it first and started barking. As the bus turned onto our street, my mother pushed me out the guard kitchen door and down the ramp and then through the gate. I tried to help by pushing my wheelchair, my hands on the metal rim of the wheels, but it was cold and my coat got in the way. Once we got to the alley, she went to the driveway, driveway outside our neighbor's house and pushed me down the driveway to the street when the, where the bus was waiting. The sky was streaked with pink and orange as my mother and I waited for the bus driver and his assistant, whom I would soon learn to call Lois, to lower the wheelchair lift. From where I sat, I could see a face peeking out the bus window, looking down at me. My mother stood to the side as the driver shifted my chair onto the lift, while Lois, from inside the bus, pushed the buttons that slowly lifted me into the bus. My mother gave me a quick kiss, and then once I was on the bus, waved, have a good day, honey. I'll be here waiting for you after school. I knew, that also, I knew that also meant that Lucky would be home, which was a comforting thought. The bus driver then closed the doors and walked to the front to get into the, back into the bus while Lois locked down my wheelchair to keep it from moving and put a seatbelt on me. Now I was really excited. I was on a wheelchair accessible bus. As the bus slowly lurched into motion, Lois explained to me that we would be picking up other students before we arrived at school. She and the driver were both very friendly. Surreptitiously, I surveyed my surroundings. The bus was regular size and had space for six wheelchairs. I was the second student on the bus. The other student, a girl who was also in a wheelchair, looked at me and smiled, but not much was said. Normally outgoing, suddenly I was shy. 
we picked up a number of other students, some of whom were also in wheelchairs. An hour and a half, and I don't know how many stops later, the bus pulled up to a massive red brick building. Over the front door was written PS 219, which I knew stood for Public School 219. Four stories high, the school took up an entire block. There were a few other wheelchair accessible buses riding, arriving at the same time. Outside the building, I saw kids everywhere, walking down the street, sitting on the steps, standing in twos and threes on the corner, coming from every direction. This is my school, I thought happily. As I watched the other students, a bell rang and the kids outside the school became pouring, began pouring through big wide, open, big wide open doors at the front of the building. A few adults stood by waiting for our bus and a few other wheelchair accessible buses to park. These were people, I later learned, who would assist us in getting in and out of the school, going to the bathroom and getting to various ther therapy appointments. I watched the process, fascinated, as one kid after another got off the bus, either walking down the steps with their braces and crutches or going down the lift and being taken into the school. Finally, it was my turn. One of the adults who had been waiting for us asked my name, introduced herself, and then wheeled me to my classroom. Another woman met us at the classroom door. You must be Judy, she smiled. I am Mrs. Parker. I'll be your teacher. Mrs. Parker asked me to sit at a desk for two with the girl she introduced as Shelley, who happened to be one of the girls I'd seen on my bus. Shelley also used a wheelchair and I learned had had polio. The class had only eight or nine students in it and every single kid was in a wheelchair or wore a brace or both. They seemed to be all different ages, which confused me. This was fourth grade. I'd never been at school before, but I knew that grades meant you were a certain age. Joey had, Joey had started kindergarten when he was five, first grade when he was six, and second grade when he was seven. The curly haired boy in the wheelchair next to me looked about my age, but I was sure that the tall girl with the brown ponytail in the corner had to be at least 16 or 17. I was relieved that the work was easy. Mrs. Parker spoke very slowly, and the worksheets she handed out repeated much of what I'd done with Mrs. Canfield. I'd been worried about how hard things would be, but I finished my work quickly. Around me, other kids were still working. I noticed that some seemed to be getting pulled out of class at random times. Therapy, Shelley whispered to me. Therapy. Shelley whispered to me when I asked her where they were going. They were getting physical therapy occupational therapy or speech therapy. I was reading a book while some of the other pupils finished one of the worksheets when Mrs. Parker told us to put our books away for lunch. We moved to another room and sat around small tables. Eating my sandwich, I quietly listened to the kids talking around me. People sounded friendly and occasionally someone asked me a question. I still felt very shy. I could hear the footsteps of kids thumping above us and their calls when they played outside. But I didn't see any of these kids. I was curious about them. After about an hour for lunch, I was surprised when Mrs. Parker turned out the la lights and announced that it was time for our rest hour. I hadn't napped since I was four, but I followed the lead of the other students and tried to sit quietly in my wheelchair with my eyes closed. I was happy when Mrs. Parker finally turned the lights back on and handed out another worksheet. I quickly completed it and then went back to reading again. It seemed like no time at all had gone by when Mrs. Parker stopped her, snapped her book closed and asked us to start packing our things up to go home. That was my first day of school. In the days that followed, I started to feel more comfortable and rapidly made friends with the other children in the class who had many different types of disabilities. A number of the students had cerebral palsy and needed some help with eating their lunch, which staff helped them with. But I discovered it was fun to help a few of my friends also. I loved feeling useful. I began to listen for the finer detail of people's preferences. How did someone wish to eat? How quickly did they chew and want help with the next bite of food? Did they want their potato chips before, during, or after their sandwich? Trixie. It turned out that Joni Lapadula, the tall girl in the corner with the ponytail, who was older as I thought, didn't know how to read very well and neither did another older girl, Jill Kirshner. I started helping them improve their reading. 
We all had fun and laughed a lot, although some of my new friends didn't speak as clearly as others. It never occurred to me not to take the time to listen, because they were my friends. I soon learned more about the kids upstairs, which is what we call the non-disabled kids who went to school with us. What? I soon learned more about the kids upstairs, which is what we call the non-disabled kids who went to school above us. The kids upstairs were different from us. They were regular kids who went to school at PS 219. We were the special education kids who were in Health Conservation 21 in the basement. We were kept completely separate, and though I didn't, although I didn't know it then, our days were totally different. First of all, the kids upstairs were in school much longer than we were. They were taught a regulated curriculum that required them to be in school from 8.30 in the morning until 3 in the afternoon, about six hours of instruction. The quantity and quality of their instruction was designed to ensure that they would progress in school, from elementary school to middle school and then to high school and, ideally, to college. In addition, school for the kids upstairs was mandatory. School is how we pass knowledge, skills, and values on to children for the good of society. In America, school is considered so important that since 1918, it has been compulsory for everyone except us. Nobody, not the teachers, not the principal, not the New York City Board of Education, expects the special ed kids to learn. Many didn't expect us to progress from elementary school to middle school, high school, university. We were expected to stay in Health Conservation 21 until we were 21 years old, at which point we were supposed to enter a sheltered workshop. I'm just wondering if I should stop there, everyone, because it's almost seven. Hi, hi, um, Spring, it's Karen here. Um, did you, is it almost at the end of the chapter? Or um, oh, it's almost at the end of a segment. Yeah, it's up to you if you want to just finish that segment and then um, we can either have a discussion or you can maybe we can just have a chat about what you've read or whatever you like. Yeah, sure. This just a two paragraphs left in the segment at least. The Great. chapter seems quite long. So, The kids in my class ranged in age from 9 to 21. All of us were forced to rest after lunch, including Joni LaPadula, the girl with the brown ponytail, and Jill Kirshner, the other older girl. Given that we got pulled from class for physical therapy, occupational therapy, and or speech therapy, our instructional time added up to less than three hours a day, which is partly why at 18 and 19, respectively, Joni and Jill still didn't know how to read very well. Not only were we not required to participate in the American system of education, we were actually blocked from it and hidden away in the basement. But from my nine-year-old perspective, Health Conservation 21 was a whole new world, and I was so happy to no longer be sitting at home every day. That's the end of the segment. Looks like the chapter is quite a few more pages, so whatever. Thanks, thanks, Ring. Um, maybe we can chat about why you um, wanted to read the book, because it, the story is, um, it's so great to, to read in Judy's own words you know, what her life was at the beginning and who supported her. Yeah. Well, honestly, I, I, I haven't read it. I, it's been on my to read list for a, a few months. And I just thought that it might be a good chance to start it. And, and also uh, maybe for other people who haven't read it to, um, I mean, now I really want to finish it, right? Because I'm interested. So maybe it will be that for other people. Um, and it is really interesting to hear. Sometimes I feel like we haven't made as much progress as I wish we had. And I know we haven't, but it is sometimes helpful to remember how different things were, you know, that's not that long ago. It's at about 60 years ago that kids were not even allowed to go to school. So, yeah, I yeah. think it's important. I agree with you. I think it's important to read our history and to have these histories uh, voiced by people who experienced it. And as you're saying, there are some things that are still similar. There are things that are different, but uh, yeah, we need to remember and, and read the, and honor those histories. Um, so I'm just wondering, I think um, 
we, I think the next, uh, next uh, speaker is here. So Spring, I wanted to thank you for coming in and, 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 uh, and joining the broadcast. Uh, again, thank you very much for um, reading Judy, some of Judy Huseman's, um, her own uh, narrative of her life. Um, I don't know if people also know that Judy Huseman was, was in the, um, uh, Bill Clinton's administration. She rose very highly to be working in government and it's great that she's read as she's written her she's written her story. So thank you very much for joining us. Yes, thank you for for having me and thank you for being part of this 